Shameless. All right, we'll just get started here. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Gilbert Arvizu. I'm an MS student at Johns Hopkins University. Um, today, we're finishing up uh, National Public Health Week. Uh, the theme today is around mental health. Uh, today's presentation is sponsored by the CHPPD Student Committee, and I'm really excited for the presentation today. If you all have any questions, uh, feel free to post them in the chat um, and we can uh, address them as we go or we'll address them after the presentation. And of course, you can always uh, come on screen, unmute and, and ask your question as well. Uh, so with that, we'll get started and I'll kick it over to Monet. Thank you so much. Awesome. Okay, good. What is it? Afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you all for showing up. I see some familiar faces. So hey to y'all and my fellow Tulane students. So as Gilbert said, we are wrapping up Public Health Week. Um, and today we are focusing on mental wellness and what it means to redefine mental health. So hopefully y'all can see my screen at any point. If you know it goes away, just Gilbert will probably like say something and let me know. Um, as he said, questions, I like to be interactive. So at any point, if you just wanna throw comments in the chat, raise your hand if it's something like really pressing that you wanna say like right then and there, but we'll definitely have some time at the end to talk chat and answer any questions you might have. So let's go on. This is me. Again, my name is Monet Gilmore. I am an MPH candidate at Tulane University where I am focusing on community health science. I also work as a health educator in the Prince George's County Public School System. And so right now I'm teaching sixth through eighth graders health. That is my main focus. And then I'm also a mental health advocate, which speaks to why I am here today. And so my passion really is just to teach and educate individuals and bring awareness to mental health and mental wellness and what that means. So people can truly just live their best lives. All right, so we're gonna start at kind of like the little basic. So what is mental health and how do we define it? So I took this definition from mentalhealth.gov. And so I really love this definition. And this is actually the definition that I teach my students because I believe it encompasses everything that mental health and mental wellness is. It includes our emotional, psychological, and even our social well-being. And so our mental health affects and relates to everything. It affects our emotions, how we think, how we feel, our actions, our behaviors, but it also affects the way we handle life, right? So these stressors that happen, trauma that happens, how our mental health is on a scale of good to bad to poor, that determines how we get through this thing called life. And I don't know about y'all, but life can be pretty hard sometimes, it can be tricky. And so when we have positive mental health, and we'll talk about that later, it makes everything go better. All right, so some statistics. If you're like me and biostats, probably wasn't your favorite, but I think these are some easy stats and some important stats for us to recognize. So one in five Americans will experience a mental illness in a given year. More than 50% will be diagnosed with a mental illness or mental health challenge or disorder at some point in their lives. And then one in 25 Americans live with a serious mental illness, such as schizophrenia, bipolar, or major depression. And so when we look at these statistics, I think it's really important to realize how common mental health and wellness is. Sometimes when we talk about mental health, our brains jump just to a mental health disorder, right? And so you can feel as though you're detached from that if you haven't been diagnosed. And so that this just goes to show, these are just the people who get diagnosed. There's such a larger population who haven't been diagnosed. So realistically, these numbers are probably a lot larger and a lot greater than we even realize. Let's go the opposite direction. There we go. Okay. 
So factors that contribute to mental illness. And so lots of times when we talk about mental health, our brains automatically jump to mental health challenge or disorder. And we'll talk about the different types of mental wellness that we can have, but first let's define mental illness. And so there's a lot of different factors that contribute to someone having a mental health challenge. This is diagnosed anxiety, diagnosed depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, and so many others that are in the DSM-5. So first we have the biological factors. And so this is basically just meaning your brain, right? So those neurotransmitters, the neurons, dopamine, serotonin, all these different things that function or are supposed to function to make us feel good. And sometimes we need help getting the amount that we need. Or sometimes our brains are just doing extra work and so they're producing way too much of these, what I call happy hormones that can make you have this high sense of euphoria, right? And then sometimes we just need to drop those down. And then we have life experiences such as trauma, abuse, those ACEs that we can experience as children. These are things that can affect us negatively and or positively. Of course, we have exposure to alcohol, drugs, whether in utero, out utero, and these things can trigger mental illness at the moment or sometimes later in life. And then we have those inherited conditions. And so this just means that if you are a loved one and a close family member, such as a mother, father, grandparent, or even aunt or uncle have been diagnosed, your chances genealogically might, you just might be at a greater risk. And so scientists and psychiatrists, they are working to try and understand this even more to see if there are some genealogical traits that can be passed down and they're still trying to figure that out. So my hope is that in the next 10 to 15 years, we'll 100% know for sure. Now, this is the part that I really want us to focus on today. Mental health does not equate to mental illness. And so I find people harping on and sitting in and living in this stigma. And that's a problem, right? Because we all have mental health. Every person on this call, every person watching, we all have a level of mental health. The same we have physical, emotional, we have mental health and we have to take care of it. So just because your mental health isn't suffering or you may not realize your mental health is suffering doesn't mean there aren't things that we can do to help improve it. So the three types of mental health. So I differentiated between positive, negative, and then a mental health challenge or illness. Now I wanna make sure that we know just because you have a mental health challenge or illness does not mean that you can't have positive mental health. It is just in addition, something that you have to live with the same as though someone who has to live with diabetes, high blood pressure, an amputation, a, they say disability, hate that word, but disability, living in a wheelchair, needing glasses, right? These are just things that we have to learn to live with. And the same with the mental health challenge. If you're diagnosed with anxiety, depression, bipolar, that's just something you have to learn to live with so that we can get and stay into a position of positive mental health. So positive mental health can revert, can refer to the presence of basically positive emotions. So when you're living good, you're feeling good, you have energy, you have a clarity of thought, that's when you know my positive mental health is doing well. This doesn't mean the absence of problems or the absence of stress. It just means that we're able to handle these things in a positive way. On the opposite hand, negative or poor mental health is when the things that are happening around us are affecting how we feel, right? So for those of y'all who are in school with me, when we have all those papers, projects, presentations, all those things building up, right? We have one or two ways to handle them. We can handle it, we deal with it, we move on. But sometimes when those things are affecting our emotions and our emotional state, and you're finding it hard to think, your mind is all jumbled up. If you have racing thoughts like myself, you can find it hard to just concentrate on one task and get through. And then we talked about the mental health challenges when, when you can have a diagnosed or sometimes undiagnosed condition that may or may not need medication. Is this in the chat for me? Oh, that's you saying post questions in the chat. Yes, please post questions in the chat if you have them and or comments. All right, so it is important to talk about red flags. You could do a whole presentation on red flags and warning signs and the different types of mental health challenges. I'm not going to read this list. It is long. I took this list from NAMI, the National Alliance of Mental Illnesses. And so I think they did a really good job just encompassing all the little things that can be a red flag. And so this is why it's very important to know 
your community and know the people you're surrounded by. Because if you're walking down the street, there are some large red flags that we might be able to see, such as someone having a hallucination or delusion or talking to themselves. Those are very no noticeable things that might be quote out of the norm, right? But feeling excessively sad, having confused thought process, changes in sex drive or eating habits. These are things that the layperson may not be able to recognize, but someone who's close to an individual might notice because of relationship. And so just take a list to read quickly to yourself and see if you can notice how sometimes these red flags might just be red flags for other things, right? Like not being hungry, not wanting to eat. I know for myself, sometimes I just get so busy, I forget that I haven't eaten that day, right? Or having headaches or migraines, right? Some people just get migraines. Again, I get migraines all the time. But for someone else, it might be a physical condition, right? But sometimes having a stomach ache can signal, hey, something's going on and the cause might be psychologically based. Questions, comments, concerns, we're doing good. Thumbs up, everyone, yes. Um, there are some questions in the oh, chat. I just don't know if you want to address those now or maybe after your presentation. I would recommend after the presentation, but it's totally up to you, Monet. No, that's fine. I just did a quick glance and I think I'll hit those at the end. But if it's like a pressing, you know, question about something on the side, please feel free to like, let me know. Okay. So we talked about the red flags, but I really want to make sure we understand what mental health actually is. And so this list, I came up with myself because surprise, surprise, I couldn't actually find anything on Google, which I thought was really interesting, right? So when we were doing, we, as in me, myself, and I, when I was doing research um, to prepare for this presentation, I was trying to read a lot about positive mental health, which is what mental health or what mental wellness is, but everything kept taking me back to mental health challenges and disorders, which great, we understand that, but for, someone who might have anxiety or might have depression, how can they still have just good mental health? And so no one seemed to have the answer. So I came up with some things on my own. So I believe that positive mental health, good mental health is simply knowing, right? But knowing what? Knowing when to say no, knowing when to set boundaries and then actually doing it, right? Executing them, knowing when to rest. We live in a society where everything is go, go, go. You know, you can sleep when you're dead. You have to have all these different jobs, passive income, right? We have to prepare for retirement, all these different pressures that sometimes when you rest, it can feel as though you're not doing, you're doing something wrong. But rest is so important because if not, you will get burnt out. Knowing when to ask for support. Yes, we have a lot of resources. Yes, you can Google, but sometimes there are people who know more than you, right? And there are trained professionals there to help which is why knowing when to reach out to a professional. Yes, you can get support from your family, from your friends, but sometimes when you can't figure it out, that's okay, but that's what people are in these careers for, to help and support you, to teach you and walk alongside you in order to get you a place of positive mental health where you could then go forth and apply the tools that they teach you. And then knowing when to share your story. And we'll talk about this a little later. So breaking the stigma, we talked about sharing your story, but I just wanted to pause and take a break. We talked about stigma, right? And sometimes there's a lot of different reasons people are afraid to ask for help, speak up and share their story. And so why? If you know why or have some thoughts as to why, feel free to throw them in the chat. If you would like to talk about it, you can raise raise your hand or unmute your mic. But I just want us to think about sometimes what causes these roadblocks for people to reach out, say they have a problem. We saw those statistics, right? 50% people in Americans are going to be diagnosed with a mental health challenge. These, those are just the people who have asked for help or unfortunately have been in such a, such a crisis situation that they've been taken against their will to a facility and are, then are diagnosed. But for those people who may not be diagnosed or might be in jail because they haven't been diagnosed or who might be unfortunately homeless because they haven't been diagnosed or can't afford their medication. How do we break these stigmas? So just some food for thought to think about as we go to the next slide. So some familiar faces live living with mental health challenges. Now, 
I don't know how you feel about each of these individual people. They all have had their share of being in the news for some good, some not so good reasons. But so we have Leonardo DiCaprio, Michelle Williams, Howie Mandel, Kanye West. We've heard a lot about him in the past couple of months. Chrissy Teigen and Mariah Carey all have mental health challenges. When I was looking up different celebrities with mental health challenges, the list was beyond exhausted. If I put everyone I found, we would be here for hours and hours and hours that I know we do not have. But just thinking about these people that we look up to, that we see on our TV screens, hear their voices, see them all the time and they too have mental health challenges that just goes to show how common they really are okay next slide all right so sharing your story i said this was one this was the last little bullet point knowing when to share your story i think one of the best ways to break into hopefully end stigma surrounding mental health is simply sharing your story we all have a mental health journey we all have a mental health story. Just because you haven't been diagnosed with anything doesn't mean that your story isn't invalid or doesn't count because it does, right? We all have things that happen in our lives. We all have days that are good and we have days that are not so great, right? And so being honest about that and vocal about that is one of the best ways and the easiest, I think, to help break the stigma surrounding mental health challenges. When I tell my students, hey y'all, I'm a little stressed out today. Not because of y'all, but I'm honest in telling them I have schoolwork, I have papers, I have a lot going on. It lets them know that their stress is valid the same way my stress is valid. But just because we are all stressed out doesn't mean that we have to act on that stress or let that stress define how our days go. But there are little things we can do to make it better, whether it's breathing exercises, whether it's journaling, wherever it is that you do to feel better, taking extra time and prioritizing that. And then this is a resource page that I have compiled. If you want to screenshot it, you know, you all are free to. But these are some resources for education, training, and support. And so we have BetterHelp, which, which is a website. They offer therapy online, mentalhealth.gov, which has a lot of resources and just information if you just want to learn more about mental health challenges and disorders. Therapy for Black girls because Black and Brown communities have higher incidence rates of anxiety and depression, but lower incident, incidence rates of getting treatment. Mental Health First Aid, I actually got recertified on yesterday. It's a great program. I highly advise many people going through that going through it to become a mental health first aider. Basically, it means that you're able to understand the signs and symptoms of crisis, but also know the words and the verbs to use to talk someone through a crisis situation to ensure that they're able to get the help that they need, whether it's just simply having a panic attack or someone being in crisis and contemplating suicide. And then we have NAMI, which is the National Alliance for Mental Health, SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and then of of course, one of the most important, the Suicide Prevention Lifeline number. I tell my students every time we go through our mental health unit, have this number in your phone. Whether you don't think you will need it for yourself, you might need it for somebody else. And the, so they have the number you can call and then the text number, which is so easy to remember, 741-741. And they are open 365 days a year. 24 seven on leap years, my students ask, what about leap years? Yes, they add on an extra day, they will be there too. So they are always there, holidays included. If you need someone, they will. there will be a trained professional on the other end to walk you through anytime you're feeling or contemplating suicide or just having a really bad day, just need someone to talk to, or you just don't even know what you're feeling, they are there. Okay. All right, so we have some reflection questions. I'm glad that there are people here so y'all can answer them. And again, I'm a teacher, so I do call on people. I will try my best to not call on you, but if I see someone I know, I might call on you. Okay, so let's go through these reflection questions. So the first one is, how is your mental health? Are you simply surviving or are you thriving? And so depending on your answer that you give, how can you get to a state of thriving if you're not already there? Now, this is a personal question. I won't make you share if you don't want to, but it is something to think 
talking about because I realize we live in a world that is so fast paced. Sometimes you don't even realize you're on a downward spiral until you've hit rock bottom. So I think it's very important that we take time to stop and reflect on not just how our lives are going, but how we are feeling personally, because then we're able to do things to get out of it or to revert. Number two, are you comfortable talking about the state of your mental health with others? Why or why not? Again, we talked about stigma, right? So what are those reasons that you feel as though, hey, I'm able to talk about this all day long and I don't have any shame? Fantastic. If you're someone who's on the other end, it's like, eh, it may makes me a tad bit uncomfortable. Let's think about why and how we can break through those barriers. And then number three, how can you advocate for your mental health and or the mental health of others in your current position in the public health field or your own personal practice? So anyone feel like sharing their answers? Sure, I'll, um, I'll tackle your reflection questions. Oh, Good you. afternoon, Good. everyone. My name is Naja. I'm also an MPH student at Tulane University. I'm happy to be here. Um, I feel like my answer could really just answer all three in one fell swoop. I believe I'm thriving, which is a lot to say within the last year and a half because COVID has been, whoo. Um, but I feel like my, how do I get to that state of thriving? Um, by being intentional about the people I keep around me, being intentional about what I'm thinking about, putting energy towards. I'm comfortable about talking about my state of mental health because it took me a while to get there and sharing my own personal advances or experiences has helped other people share what they're dealing with or other resources and sharing that information, which is also helpful because word of mouth is more powerful than we think it is, especially with social media and the technological advancements that we're a part of. As for advocating for my mental health or the mental health of others, I'm a data specialist at Mount Sinai Hospital. We're working with persons living with HIV and AIDS. So it's very taxing sometimes on top of them having HIV or AIDS, they're experiencing other chronic conditions or socioeconomic barriers that could impede on what they need to do to be a healthier person, as well as the help that we provide to them. So sometimes if I need a mental health day, I'll share that with my supervisor, excuse me for the background noise. I'll share that with my supervisor and she'll understand and I'll take that time off. Or just having, sorry, excuse me. Regular New York streets, my apologies. Um, and then as for the mental health of others, so like with my coworkers, a simple text or call, hey, just checking in, nothing work related. How are you feeling today? How can I help assist you? Is there anything that you need taken off your plate to feel better? So things of that nature and making it a daily or weekly practice across because I work at two different sites and I have a staff of maybe 10 to 12 people. So just checking in makes all the difference and being able to just woosah, take a breath and then jump right back into the work. Um, so that's how I'm able to thrive and I feel comfortable talking about my state of mental health as well as advocate for myself and my colleagues. I love that. I think you answered everything beautifully and I think you're doing great. And I think the point you make about making it an everyday practice, right? Not just you sharing how you feel, but checking with others because no, you don't have to say, hey, this is a mental health check, right? On a scale of one to five, how is your mental state? We don't have to do it that way. It can just be as casual as what do you need or what can I do to lighten the load, as you said. And uh, subconsciously, they're telling you what they need and not even realizing that it's bettering their mental health. Awesome. Absolutely. Thank you. Anyone else want to share before we get to questions? Right, cool. Okay, so I have the chat open. So I see three questions. Tyler asks, if you don't mind sharing, what are your favorite ways to design an environment that leads to positive mental health? And so I think, again, sharing your story, right? So I'm very honest and vocal about the experiences I've had with mental health, whether it's been anxiety, seasons of depression, 
after stress overload and burnout. And I think that sharing that like with my students is very important because they see me, their teacher. And sometimes it's hard for them to realize that teachers were people too. And so when I let them know, hey, I was in middle school, I was an anxious child. I used to have an anxiety attacks. And these are the things that I did to help get me through that, but you don't have to stay there and you won't stay there, right? And again, the teenage years are hard. I think they're hard for everyone in middle school, especially. And then at COVID on top of that, I know they have dealt with a lot more than I ever have. And with social media, that's a whole, a whole separate issue, right? And so being able to have those open conversations with them, I think is very important. Also, as Nadia said, those check-ins are so, so, so key, right? Because I work with children, that's kind of my target area, but just being observant, I think is one of the best things you can do, not just for children, but just for people, right? Sometimes we can be so consumed with our sense of self that we don't even realize someone deteriorating right in front of our eyes or crying out for help right in front of our eyes. And then lastly, educating yourself. I think like being on talks like these, researching yourself, being able to understand those red flags and those signs and symptoms are so important because if you can't recognize for yourself or understand for yourself, you won't be able to do that for somebody else. So that, I hope that answers your question, Tyler. Naja says, what are some self-care routines or practices that you practice to recenter yourself? you know, the thing that we are always working on, the practice of self-care, right? So I'm not gonna sit here and say, I have a 10-step routine that I do every single day to decompress because I will be lying and I'm not a liar. So I will say it depends on the day and the season. Sometimes I do great, you know, I have my like nice baths and my days, my spa days, and I do all these things and I'm feeling fantastic. And then I have weeks like these past two weeks where I had to remind myself just to drink water. So I think that sometimes we can put so much pressure on ourselves that it has to be done a certain way. Self-care has to look like a certain thing when honestly it's really giving yourself what you need in that moment. So if it's me taking an extra 30 minutes to watch Modern Family, then I take an extra 30 minutes just so I can laugh, right? If I'm taking 10 minutes outside longer walking my dog just to get fresh air, then those are the little things that I'm doing. So I think sometimes when we think practice self-care, we think about the Instagram reels with you know the girls like going to check into a hotel and they're getting a massage and they're spending all this money, money that I don't have, right? To take these three-day vacations. And sometimes that's not feasible and that's okay, but what can we do, right? Whether it's you getting yourself Starbucks is self-care. Then yes, I will spend $5.37 on a way too expensive drink that makes me happy or it's getting my nails done. Or sometimes it's just saying no, right? Saying no, I don't feel like doing this. I don't wanna do it. I'm just, I'm just not going to do it, right? Declining that phone call that sometimes is really hard to do. You see someone calling, you know they might need you, but you also are like crying at the same time. Maybe telling them, hey, I'll call you back. They won't hate you. So I think those are some of the self-care practices that I do, but I'm also learning to integrate um, as more habits. All right, last question. Tania says, I think that mental health is so important and often ignored intentionally, yes, and unintentionally, of course. Many young children have taken their lives or struggle with dealing with life stressors since you teach sixth or eighth grade. What are some things you teach them or do with them to help, if anything, or what do you plan on doing in the future? Yes. Yeah, so Thankfully, um, my county does prioritize mental health education. So it's already been designed as a unit that I teach. And so I try and make it as long as I can. It's one of my favorite units to teach. But I think the first thing is opening the door to the conversation, right? How do you feel? What's going on? And I think that sometimes going into their world is something that a lot of adults fail to do. I don't always understand the things that they tell me, the shows that they watch, the books that they read, and I definitely don't understand all the social media stuff, but just sitting down and building that relationship first is going to be the thing that allows them to come to you in the future. If you don't have a relationship with a child or anyone for that matter, they won't feel comfortable with you to tell them in the future when something is wrong. So I think that as Tyler mentioned, the safe space, right? Allowing them to know that when you're valued, you're appreciated and you're loved, 
that's the that's the first step right before I can teach you and expect you to learn from me or heed my advice you have to know that when I care about you and I see you because lots of times we'll see someone but we don't really see them right or know them so getting in making the time because sometimes time is hard to find right but making the time to curate those relationships I think that's the first thing and so what I teach them I try and teach them tiny 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 coping skills I do not take a lot of thought or energy to remember right so one of my favorite is just deep breaths right before I test I always like to do a little mini meditation with them um they have taken it to the extreme where it's like we meditate on the desks now and so you know sometimes just letting them do what they do if you like to meditate hanging off your desk and that's what it takes for you to get to a place of peace then do that so allowing them to find what works for them I bought little journals and so I gave some of them journals I have coloring pages and just little brain breaks activities that they can do because I was a kid I always doodled I would always have like little hearts and flowers going down the side the margins of my page right and so it doesn't mean that I'm not paying attention but it was a way for lots of times for me to get that anxiety that I was feeling just out and onto the page so having little things for them to do to kind of deal with them, those stressors or just giving them five extra minutes in my room before they have to go to that math class that they really hate or they have to go to science you know sometimes you just need a space to just be and then tackle the day so those are a few things that I do and they have a bunch of minute meditations like on YouTube and they're great for adults like when they're doing them they're really for me like I'm the one meditating you know I tell them it's for them but it's like I need a break so we're gonna the whole class is gonna do a meditation so those are the little things that I do any other questions comments concerns no one's in a mode of crisis or triggered please let me know Okay, good. All right, so last slide. So you contact me if you need anything or would like me to send you the PowerPoint or any list of resources or anything else that I may have or could find for you. That's how you get in contact with me. Instagram, because you know, social media, everyone has that these days. The old fashioned email, if you check your email like social media as I do and then LinkedIn is just my name because I forget that social media and people use that you know so I have that too well I hope you all enjoyed I really appreciate seeing some familiar faces and names I won't read them all but you know who you are I really appreciate it and for those that don't know me that took the time to watch I really appreciate you trusting me and my wisdom to share my knowledge with you so thank you for spending your Sunday afternoon with me. And I'll throw it yes, back. thank you. No, thank you so much, Monet. I really appreciated uh, the discussion. I really liked the, um, the, the talking point about just because you have mental illness doesn't mean you don't have positive mental health. We see that on the physical health right, side, right? Uh, folks who have diabetes or disease they still are able to live healthy lifestyles despite being ill. And so I think really making that point, but on the mental health side um, can really uh, reduce those stigmas that, that we talked about. Um, so that was, that was a really great point. Um, but again, thank you. I wanna echo the chat uh, about how important this discussion was and how great it was. So thank you, Monet, for finishing this uh, National Public Health Week uh, uh, series uh, pro provided by the student committee of the CHPPD section. Uh, I hope you all had a great National Public Health Week. Um, all of our videos that we've done this week will be on the CHPPD YouTube page. So if you miss something, please check it out. Um, and I hope everything that you learned from this presentation and all the other presentations that you will use that in your communities. So thank you all. Have a great rest of your weekend and take care. Be safe. Thank you all. And watch Gilbert's presentation too. Shameless plug. <laughs> Bye everyone.